In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, form within us a worthy dwelling place for you and for your Holy Spirit. Grant us that spirit to search within the depths of our hearts and to find those wounds where you wish to give us the saving grace of the only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This we pray through the intercession of the glorious ever-Virgin Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Let's get her mic turned on. Yeah. And you should be live. Hello, hello. Ah, there it is. All right, friends, give me a minute here to get set up. How's everybody doing on this Wednesday night? Yeah, you surviving? You're, you're hanging in there? It's getting towards the end of the semester. The sun's coming out more. Um, I was very excited to be here and get off the plane and whew, humidity. I live in Colorado and there's no humidity. We are so parched and dry, so this is a real treat. It's an even bigger treat to be with all of you, so thank you for coming. So I'm excited to share with you about a, um, a topic that's really gaining a lot of traction in the Catholic world today, and it's a real passion of mine, and that's healing as an adult child of divorce. Um, as Gabriel mentioned, I work with a ministry called Life Giving Wounds, and Life-Giving Wounds' mission is to give voice to the deep pain of adult children of divorce and to help them find deep healing in Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. Now, I just want to acknowledge that within this group of us here today, there's likely a lot of different ways of looking at divorce, different ways that we've experienced it. Maybe you yourself are a child of divorce, and maybe you are ready to move on that healing journey and see what's there for you. Maybe you're an adult child of divorce and you're like, yeah, 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 I don't know about this. I'm, I think I'm fine. Like, yeah, yeah, that was so long ago. Yeah, it really doesn't affect me. Maybe you're someone who cares deeply about an adult child of divorce. Maybe it's a roommate, a friend, maybe a boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, I invite all of us, wherever we're coming from, to be curious and open as I share my heart with you and what I've learned on this topic. So why is this such a big deal? Since the 1970s, when divorce became legal in the United States, there's been about one million children added to the number of children of divorce each year. So that's roughly around 50 million adult children of divorce out there, children and adults who have divorced parents. Um, it's really everywhere, everywhere you turn. And then because of that, we hear a lot of what um, sociologists call happy divorce talk. What is this? You know, you've all heard it. You know what? It's fine. As long as the parents are happy, then the kids will be happy. And, you know, kids are really resilient. Like, this isn't going to affect them like you think it will. They're going to bounce back. It's going to be totally fine. Um, and people will praise it and hype it up and say, well, you know what? There's a lot of benefits to being an, a child of divorce. You get two birthday parties. You get two Christmases double the presents, double the people. And yes, there are some of those things, but more often than not, it's a great grief and a great sorrow. Folks will often say, isn't this just another form of childhood? You know, like, say, like having parents who are in the military. You know, you move around a lot. That's one form of childhood. Or maybe, you know, when you're in a large family and you have a lot of siblings and there's a lot of things happening. Picture my own family saying that. Um, or if you have a child, <clears throat> excuse me, a sibling who has special needs. Like, that's a different kind of family life growing up. And, you know, children of divorce, they seem to be okay. You know, you can't pick them out of a crowd. They get good grades. They're successful. They have jobs. They seem to be well-adjusted. Psychologists, researchers, and pastors all agree having divorced parents radically changes the structure of childhood itself and it has lasting repercussions. It seems like there's a sort of sleeper effect 
What do I mean by this? Oftentimes, children whose parents divorced in their childhood will grow up seemingly normal, everything's fine, but then as they leave home, they go to college, they form deep romantic relationships, they might even get married. And at that point is when the greatest effects start to become visible. Because we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we're missing. I felt this when we first got married, my husband and I, almost 25 years ago, and we're starting to set up our home and it's all exciting. And you know, a couple weeks in, a couple months in, all of a sudden I realized, I don't know how to clean a refrigerator. Did someone clean the refrigerator in my home growing up? Yes, because I never remembered my refrigerator looking like how mine did in my new home. Um, so I called my mom. So I'm like, how did this happen? And she said, oh yeah, I cleaned the refrigerator every weekend when you were at your dad's house. That explains it. I never saw my mom clean the fridge because she did it while I wasn't there. So that's a small way. <clears throat> in bigger ways, I saw that I had gaps in my formation. For instance, when my husband and I started to not get along, when there was tension in our relationship, when we may, maybe was have an argument, maybe even a fight, I didn't know what to do with this. Because in my home growing up, if there was tension, if there was an org argument, it would lead to doors slamming and escalate to the point that someone would leave. And then someone definitively left when my parents divorced and separated. So that's what I knew. So if you have tension in your relationship, I'm thinking seismic earthquake, not thunderstorm. So I'd like to share with you a bit of a victory of mine. And this is something that I, I actually spent some time writing my own story, um, like in a narrative form. And this was a huge triumph because just to have the words to put paper and pen to what I experienced, um, I remember finishing it in a public library in Littleton, Colorado, and bawling in my little cubicle silently, because that was something I was very good at, but just having the words was just amazing for me. Um, this was published in an international journal on spirituality. It's on my own website. It's also on the Life Giving Wounds blog, in case you want to read the whole thing. And this deals with the first time I realized that something was radically changing in my family. Dad seems sad. Can dads get sad? I said to myself, bewildered, as my four-year-old hand reached desperately for whatever scratch paper and pencil I could find. Like looking for a clean rag to put pressure on a bleeding wound, I needed to draw to ease the pain right away. It had to be a happy picture. The sun shining, bushy trees, a house with proportionate windows, waving stick figures with smiling eyes. Why this frantic, hurried attempt? Standing next to a tower of cardboard boxes, I learned my dad was leaving. Leaving to go to his own house, I was told. Barely grasping that my dad could even be sad, this idea of living elsewhere was incomprehensible. Needing to offer my Band-Aid at once, I gave him my picture, the smiling house and the waving family, a small present with which to decorate his new place. I had yet to understand that my own house my own family, my own self, would forever be changed that day. My parents separated in the early 80s, and what followed was a bitter clash of lawyers, courtrooms, and custody settlements, ending in a back-and-forth, teeter-tottering arrangement for my younger brother and me. Thankfully, my mom and dad continued to reside in the same town until we graduated high school. My brother and I even went to the same church every single Sunday together, but with a different parent each week and at a different mass time, so they didn't run into each other. Even with these seemingly solid pillars, I don't have a lot of vivid childhood memories. I remember fun vacations, camping trips, weeks at my grandparents' home, and goofing off with my little brother. But when I remember most is the stress of daily Packing, meticulously thinking everything through as I moved back and forth between two worlds. 
I remember painstakingly planning what things to take, to leave, to wash, and to find. I recall preparing my homework assignment at the one house that had the computer. Remember, it's the 1980s, so not everybody had computers. So the one house had the computer. I would do the assignment, hoping against hope that my teacher wouldn't change the assignment before it was due, because I had no way to revise it since I would be at the parent's house that didn't have the computer. The angst, the tightness in my chest of getting everything just right lest I inconvenience mom or dad by forgetting some necessary item. I remember taking an extra large duffel to school from first grade through high school, in addition to my school backpack. A small sort of Sherpa, schlepping my life's essentials from port to port every other day, every other weekend, in a blue polyester broken zippered bag. That was me. I was different than my classmates, and I had the literal baggage to prove it. Maybe some of you relate to my story. Maybe you have a similar story of your own. Maybe some of you had a better experience of your parents' divorce or separation. Maybe some of you had a harder experience. No matter what, all of us were deeply impacted by our parents' divorce or separation. Psychologists will tell you that even if our parents divorced and were on friendly terms with one another, even if it was a, quote, good divorce, there are still lasting effects. A famous Catholic apologist named Deacon Harold Burke Silvers has this quote. Parents who divorce lay down the cross of their broken marriage, and it is their children who must pick it up and carry it from then on. I'll say that one more time because I think it's so well put. Parents who divorce lay down the cross of their broken marriage, and it is their children who must pick it up and carry it from then on. See, we lost the love of our parents together. That's what the loss is. Our mom and our dad together form the bedrock, the foundation of our lives. They're our origins. That's where we came from. I think of a story from a retreat we were just on this last weekend. We did a life-giving wounds retreat in Denver. And a friend of mine told the story of how his five-year-old has a sort of radar that whenever he and his wife are dancing, whenever they're hugging, he like can sense it and comes and puts himself right in the middle. That's where we belong as children, right in the middle, in the safety of our mom and our dad, in their love together that what is what gave life to us, to each of us. So when we lose this love of our parents' love together, our home is never the same. Even if it's the same structure, either mom or dad is not there. It's never going to be the same. And this is true no matter what age we were when the divorce happened, whether we were a newborn or two years old, or whether we are well into our 40s. It still has deep and lasting effects. But here's the kicker, my friends. Often we adult children of divorce don't even realize it. We don't know. We don't see it for what it is, this great loss. Why? In Life-Giving Wounds, we call this the wound of silence. The wound of silence is what makes it hard to acknowledge and grieve our family's breakdown with all the effects that followed because it takes so much for us to realize that there's a wound there at all. There are several reasons for this. So the first one is simply divorce is a trauma. It's a trauma for all involved. Okay, trauma, we hear that word a lot today. What is a trauma? I'm not a psychologist. But loosely defined, trauma is when there's something that happens in your life that exceeds your own ability to cope with it, to process it, or to understand it. So if something big happens when you're a child, your coping strategies, your ability to process it is small because you're small. But something big happens that's bigger than what you can handle. The catechism calls divorce a trauma. Look it up, it's catechism number 2385. And it says this, 
Divorce introduces disorder into the family and society. It brings grave harm to the deserted spouse, to the children traumatized by the separation of their parents and are often torn between them. Another reason for the wound of silence is our trauma response. You've probably heard this. Our body, our nervous system has ways of dealing with trauma, things that happen that are too big for us to deal with or process. So there's two active ways, fight or flight, and then there are two passive ways, freeze or fawn. We find in life-giving wounds that the freeze response is the most common for adult children of divorce, also called ACOD for short. Because when the divorce happened, when the separation happened, there was no one to see them in the midst of that grave harm. There was no one to hear them. There was no one to, hear, to know us in our pain. It was just too much. And so as a result, what are we left to do? We put it on ice. We stuff it down. We send it outside of conscious awareness. We banish the experience. We exile it away. Another way of looking at this is a phrase that consists of two words, unthought knowns, unthought knowns. This is a phrase coined in the 1980s by Christopher Bullis, and it basically refers to this. There are things that happen in our lives that we, we know they happened, but we, don't, we're, we lose the capacity to actually think about it. So you experience something, you know it's true in your bones, but it's never like come up to the level of conscious awareness. Unthought knowns. I experienced unthought knowns when I read an excellent book called Between Two Worlds by Elizabeth Marquardt. She does all this sociological research and then does it with um, stories of children of divorce and how they grew up and where they're at now. It was the most insane experience to read this book because I felt like I was reading about my life, like I could have written this book except I'd never thought about it and never had the words for it. Unthought knowns. On our retreats on life-giving wounds, people will come thinking, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm going to get out of this. I don't know. I mean, it happened so long ago. I really think, I think I'm okay. And they hear the story from one presenter and another, and they go in their small groups, and they hear other people talking about their experiences, and they are shocked at how deeply they resonate with what others are sharing. I like to say we all have different stories, but they all have the same theme, the loss, the grief of not having our parents loving one another together. So our stories are all different, but man, do they ever rhyme. Okay, Beth, you're probably saying, sure, adult children of divorce suppress a lot, but what is it like for them on the inside? And so for this, I'd like to continue with my story. Essentially, there were two Beths. I had two lives, two personas split straight down the middle. I could act one way at my mom's, but not at dad's. I could ask for some things at dad's, but not at mom's. I learned what to say and what not to say after the sting of revealing something that was supposed to be a secret at one house and letting the cat out of the bag at the other parent's house and seeing how that could ignite the flames of a new argument in an instant. So as a result, I rapidly mastered the skill of assessing any given situation to see what was required of me. Who do you need me to be? Or Tell me what to do and I'll do it, just so you'll be pleased. Because if you're happy, then I can be happy. But if you're unhappy and it could somehow be my fault, then something is wrong with me and then I can't be happy. I took it on. The task of making sense of these two competing worlds fell squarely on my duffel-bearing shoulders. Deep within me, I craved wholeness, though I didn't realize this at the time. Who am I deep down? How do I make sense of these two opposing realities? I look like my mom, but I act like my dad. I have my mom's voice, but my dad's last name. Yet my parents, the ones whose union brought me into existence, resist even being in the same room together. So where does that leave me? 
internally divided, a powerless bridge between two forces who would rather not connect. If I just did what I'm supposed to do, then everyone around me could be happy. And you can find the rest of that on uh, the Life Giving Wounds blog. So you can see that I was a total people pleaser. I was always seeking approval from outside to dictate how I was feeling inside. That's one of the main characteristics of adult children of divorce. So what are some others? Break. I want to share some, some common things that adult Absolutely. children of divorce experience, their beliefs, their coping mechanisms, their characteristics. But I want you to know that these are not, they're not all of them, and you may not resonate with each and every one of them. You may resonate with some, but not others. Just know there's a lot of different angles here. So I'm going to share some of the top ones for me and ones that I've seen as well. The first one is survival mode survival mode. As our parents split up, they had to rebuild their own lives because suddenly they didn't have a livelihood together, which in the midst of that left a lot less time for us, their children. So we often had to grow up really fast. We had to white knuckle it and be self-reliant and do what we have to do in order to survive. I think of my friend Craig who when his parents divorced and they're in the midst of building their other separate lives, realized no one realized he didn't have money for school lunch. And his dad was too busy to notice, his mom was too busy to notice. And so he had to resort to stealing money out of his stepmom's jewelry box in order to have enough money to pay for his school lunch. And he was left with that shame, I need to eat. But in order to eat, I feel like I have to steal because nobody is noticing, nobody is hearing me when I ask if I can have lunch assistance here. Like, can we get it from the, the school lunch program? And his dad's like, no, we don't do that. Not realizing my son needs to eat, so he needs money. Another common characteristic is um, hypervigilance. Hypervigilance. This is when you're always kind of scanning, always trying to read the room. Where are people at? What kind of mood is mom or dad in right now? Can I ask for that thing I want? Oh, no, I just need to stay out of their way. We had to learn this very early on because we're always waiting for the other shoe to drop because the other shoe did drop. Our parents divorced. They split up. The worst possible thing in our little worlds did happen. So what else is going to go wrong? This makes it really hard for us to rest. This makes it really hard for us to just play. And because of that, it makes it hard for us to feel free enough to enter into true joy. I think of this when I look at my two youngest daughters sleeping at night. They're so peaceful in their little beds and their little angelic faces. And I just love them. Like, my heart just melts. And Without fail, in an instant, I am thinking of something absolutely horrific happening to them. Why do I do that? It's because I felt joy seeing them and loving them, and that felt unsafe. So I had to come up with something bad that could happen so that I can be prepared for the other shoe to drop in my mind. Another common characteristic is self-protection. Self-protection. We ACODs tend to build walls, especially around our hearts. We keep our cards close. We let few people see the real deep, hard parts of our hearts and our stories. Perhaps when we were younger, we had to learn to keep secrets, and that just stayed with us. We have a tendency to become really cynical in a way to protect ourselves always thinking the worst of others, always thinking the worst thing is going to happen. We are really distrustful oftentimes. For me, I was very distrustful of hearing my husband tell me that he loved me for years. He would say, I love you, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, you know, okay, sure. I, I don't know why you said that, but okay. I, I believe you do, but why did you say I love you right now? Is it, did I do something? Did you see something? Like, what prompted you? Like, I would analyze. I would try and, like, pick it apart. Like, where did this come from? Let me, let me put it under the microscope and try to understand. 
Like, why are you telling me you love me? And it was just a really hard concept for me to just rest and lean into. And then eventually, in the midst of my healing journey, he came with me to see my therapist. And the next time my therapist and I met, she was a really lovely woman. She's like, your husband just loves you so much. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I know. He has to do that. And she's like, no, no, no. He really loves you, Beth. And I'm like, yeah, he's, he made a vow to love me before God. And he's a good Christian man. Of course he loves me. And she's like, Beth, we know a lot of the same people. Your husband really loves you. If I told him, Ted, you need to take a year off of work so that Beth can really go deep into her healing, he would figure out a way to do it. He wouldn't understand it. He'd be like, oh, I don't know how the house is going to work. But he would do it. And that is not the case for every husband. And that hit me. Hearing from a third party who had some authority in my life that my husband loved me actually made it stick. And from then on, it was easier and easier to just allow myself to believe that my husband truly loved me. Another characteristic is our fierce loyalty to our parents. We adult children of divorce saw our parents suffer. We witnessed it. We saw the tears. We saw the breakdowns. We saw the chaos. We were a part of it with them. And we do not want to hurt them anymore. We would hurt ourselves before we would allow them to be hurt because we saw how horrific it was for them, especially if one of our parents didn't even want the divorce. We don't want to do anything more to hurt that parent. But what if, what if there's a part of us that's grateful for the divorce? What if the divorce itself was actually necessary for safety or protection? What if we are grateful the divorce happened because there was abuse? I want to make sure you know that Catechism of the Catholic Church and Canon Law does say that it is morally permissible for the separation of spouses in cases, in extreme cases, for safety. But let's take a step back from that, the divorce being good in that situation. Because what we really wanted, more than a divorce so that we could be safe, we wanted our parents to resolve their issues. We wanted our parents to have a healthy marriage. We wanted them to be truly united the way that they promised they would before God on their wedding day. We wanted them to be shoulder to shoulder, a team turning towards us, their children. And when that is not possible, divorce or separation is the next best option. So we can hold both. We can hold both of these feelings within us. We can grieve and mourn the loss of what was. We can grieve and mourn the loss of what we never received. And we can be grateful for the safety that the divorce or separation brought about. <clears throat> Another characteristic is that the divorce affected our belief in God. Now, we as humans, we are wired to look for patterns. We are wired to look for familiarity. We build templates in our brains, and it's like a super highway. When we see something that fits into that pattern, we are making connections, and we are often running with our assumptions. So our earthly parents step into first creating that super highway in our brain for what is a father? So this can make it really hard for us to think about God as father if our own earthly father was not as loving and kind as we hear God the father was or is. So for instance, if our earthly father was distant, if he was uninterested in us, if he was dismissive of the things that we wanted to tell him about, then when we go to build a relationship with God the father, when we try to pray to him, we're expecting him to react in the same way. Why would God the Father want to know about me? Fathers aren't interested in their children, so why should I even bother praying? Or on the flip side, if our earthly father was harsh, 
if he was critical of us, if he was really demanding. When we go to God the Father, we feel like we got to really watch it. Because if we screw up, he is going to come down hard on us, just like our human father did. The same can be true with our relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary. A friend of mine had a mom who was very manipulative. She would use guilt trips a lot to try and control her daughter. And so as she grew in her faith and people told her, hey, you should develop a relationship with our mother Mary, she was like, nah, I don't know. She'd be like, you know what, Mary? I have a mom. It's not going so great. If you could maybe just stay over there in the corner, that would be awesome. She projected her relationship with her earthly mom onto Our Lady. What really changed this for my friend was the Our Lady of Sorrows devotion, the seven sorrows of Mary. Because as she was able to enter into those seven points that Our Lady suffered in her relationship as the mother of Jesus, all of a sudden she realized, oh, Mary gets deep pain. I've experienced deep pain. That totally leveled the playing field, and all of a sudden, relationship with Our Lady became possible for her. So I want to share with you a little bit of my own testimony of healing. So way back in 2016, I was pregnant again with our eighth baby, sweet little Eleanor. Um, and it was very stressful because as soon as we found out, we decided it is time to renovate the kitchen. This is something I'd wanted for five years. So I'm like, yes. And we did it, and it was beautiful. It was exhausting. But then my husband's like, you know what? We're already in the renovation mode. Let's just keep going. OK? So we decided to add on to our house as well. So the entire pregnancy was stressful, picking out tile and all the things in the midst of raising seven other children and a busy family life. Um, so I was exhausted. It was really rough. And then the birth came. The birth was a lot harder than normal. The recovery took a lot longer. And then on top of that, when sweet little Eleanor was about five weeks old, I had a traumatic health event, and I nearly died. So that was like the one, two, three punch that all of a sudden my normal coping skills of being the go-getter wife and the get-it-done mom and superwoman were gone. I couldn't do it anymore. I was totally empty. I had no go power. I had no way to just jump back into my life. Everything felt heavy. Everything felt dark. And I just felt like an empty shell of what I had been before. A story that illustrates this, um, because of, I was feeling so out of it, I ordered school supplies ahead of time. Um, do you guys know how this works, where the school has it? It's a company that does it. OK, good. Um, so I'm like, I'm going to do this this year. And I did it. And they arrived, and they were beautiful. And we were having guests over. So I asked my son to put them in the garage until we needed them for the school's meet and greet. Fast forward to the meet and greet day. I asked my son to go get them, bring them inside so I could kind of sort them out. He comes back, Mom, they're not there. I'm like, ah, of course they're there. I literally just saw them a couple days ago. They're right here. Go get them. He goes, he comes back. No, Mom, really, they're not there. I'm like, ah, come on. So we walk out to the garage together, and sure enough, the box is gone. And I'm completely dumbfounded. And I look at my son, I'm like, I don't, I don't know, they were right here. And my sweet boy goes, oh, dad told us to take all the boxes in the garage out for recycling yesterday. Guys, I burst into tears. And this wasn't like a, <laughs> it was like a, <gasps> Like just a torrent of weeping from the bowels of my spirit, wailing. And I realized this could be scary for the kids, so I had the presence of mind to go upstairs to my room and really let it flow. Um, I must have had my phone with me because it started ringing, and it was my husband who wasn't even home. And he's like, honey, what's wrong? You need to go downstairs. The kids are scared. <laughs> like, you don't understand. 
because I just had no energy to go school supply shopping at the 11th hour and go to 50 different stores to get 40 different things and we have to still go meet the teacher and we did that and she was really sweet. You can put out your supplies here, do, do, do. And I'm like, we don't have them. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> but that just shows how I was not myself. I normally don't lose my mind crying like that about school supplies. Um, and this went on for months. I remember visiting a friend at her house and just telling her, again, I don't feel like myself. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just can't snap out of it. And she looked at me and said, I think you need to go back to counseling. I think there's things related to how you grew up having divorced parents that you just haven't dealt with yet. What? What? That's the answer here? Because I had done the counseling thing. I had forgiven my parents, or at least thought I had. I had done the work. But a part of me knew she's probably right. There's probably something more here. So at this moment of decision, I said, I'm going to plant the flag. I am busy, but I'm going to run after this because I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and not feeling like I can do the mom thing and the wife thing like I have. So I hit it from all angles. I went to therapy once a week, sometimes twice a week. And each time after I saw my therapist, I went directly to the Adoration Chapel because therapy rips off the Band-Aid and Jesus heals. I also journaled like a crazy person. Happy journaling, like, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for showing me this. Um, crying journaling, I did a lot more crying. Jesus, how did this happen? Why did you allow this? And I, my favorite was the angry journaling. <laughs> Just getting all the emotion up from those places that I had banished it and out onto the page. I read all that I could get my hands on, on healing, and especially adult children of divorce issues. I went to spiritual direction, I went to mass more often during the week, and I went to confession more regularly. I also went to my first life-giving wounds retreat. It was so much work. But I made that decision. I decided I'm going to lean into this instead of running from it like I had for most of my adult life. And I met Jesus there in a deeper and more intimate way than I even knew was possible. Pope Francis says that our wounds are points of intimacy with God. Our wounds are points of intimacy with God. Because when we have these wounds, when we have these places in our heart where there's pain, where there's sorrow, where there's trauma, Jesus wants to know about it. Sure, he's heard about it. He knows because he's God. But he wants to hear it from us. He wants to hear it from your heart, what you experienced. He loves honesty. I picture Jesus when I finally get to the point where I can just be brutally honest and I can just lay it all out there in all its glory. I picture him just smiling and being like, yeah. Finally, now I can do something about it with you. Because you're honest enough to tell me, and you're honest enough to let me in, and that's exactly what I want. And when I let him into that dark, hard place, I found that he wept with me, that he suffered with me in all those moments of intense pain and heartbreak. And this process was incredibly raw. I felt like I was coming apart. I felt broken. I felt spent. It reminded me of if you're unloading the dishwasher and you have a wine glass and you're putting it away in the cabinet, but it slips out of your fingers and you have tile floors. That wine glass is going to break into a million pieces. I felt like that wine glass on the floor in the midst of this journey. But Jesus didn't just pick up the shards and put them back together the way it was. I feel like he took those pieces and he put me back together in a way that I had more capacity, that I had greater freedom, that I had greater confidence in him and who he was and how he did work in my life and how he was working now. I was able to bring all my fear to him, 
all my anxiety, my perfectionism, my need to manage and control things, that slipped out of my hands like the wine glass. And Jesus put it back together so that I could hold more of him for my husband, for my children and my motherhood, for my friendships. That new capacity enabled me to do ministry and life-giving wounds, and it enabled me to be standing here in front of you today giving this talk. So I want you to know that healing is a cycle. There's no way to be like, I'm starting here, I'm healing, and now I'm healed. Ding! That's not how it works. I wish it did, you guys. I wish I had a magic pill. Like, you just say this, like, three-second formula. This is how you do it. But I found that healing is a cycle. Over and over and over. That whole journey of me not feeling like I had anything to give and then going into the depths and then coming out was the big first cycle. And since then, I've had to do it over and over again with smaller issues and smaller things coming up as there is more to unpack in my story. There are folks who say, you know what? I've been healed. Jesus has healed me. I did the work and now I'm moving forward. For me, I will be healed in eternity when I finally please Jesus in the arms of our Lord for eternity in heaven. But until then, I am healing. As long as I'm breathing air, I am healing. Because this is a journey. This is going to take the rest of my life. And I'm actually kind of glad about that because as I encounter more places in my heart, more wounds, that is a new place to meet our Lord. He's waiting there for me. And he has something very rich and precious to bestow on me each time I find a new place to encounter him in my heart. So here's the basic cycle. Things come up. We're triggered, if you will. And when that happens, we have a moment of decision. Am I going to run away? Am I going to suppress it? Am I going to numb out and freeze? Or am I going to lean in to whatever is activating me, whatever feels off, whatever is upsetting? Am I going to get curious about it? Can I unpack it and take it to our Lord and see what he says about it? And it's this leaning in that causes transformation. Little by little, again and again, as we lean into it, we will be changed. And it becomes a sort of skill. It becomes a habit, a strength. Just like when you go and work out at the gym, you have to tear the muscle in order to have some gains. That's how it works here too. You have to give into it. You have to break it down in order to build it up. So don't waste the triggers, my friends. They're deep, true, real invitations from Jesus. So I have a story to illustrate what leaning into our pain and our hurt can look like. So in our family, we pray the rosary together each night um, before bed. It's not pious and beautiful like one might think, you know, on your knees and your hands folded. Um, with so many children, especially when they're young, it was more of a circus sideshow feel, you know, chaos, kids everywhere screaming, needing sippy cups and drinks. Um, and so my husband and I early on decided if both of us are home, both of us need to be engaged for rosary just to make it go more smoothly. And so one night, just before rosary time, I looked at my phone and I saw that I had a text message from a dear friend of mine who was going through a desperate time in her marriage. And my heart just broke. And I wanted to take a minute to respond to her with kindness and empathy. And while I was doing that, my dear darling husband walked in the room and he saw me on my phone, and he was frustrated, as husbands and wives often get frustrated with one another. And he just looked at me and was like, ah, you're on your phone again, it's time for rosary, and he leaves the room. I snapped in that moment. I lost it. I felt like a monster, and I was angry out of all proportion. I like slammed the phone down, and I start, and I started stomping my feet on our hardwood floors so that he would know I was not happy. And I just started thinking to myself, I can't win. I can't win. I can't win. I'm trying to help my friend, but now he's mad at me because I'm not doing the rosary thing. And thankfully, I had a presence of mind to realize, oh, I'm overreacting here. What is this about? 
And so I leaned in and I actually leaned against the wall of my house and I just did a deep breath in and out and I asked the Holy Spirit to show me what was going on. And I said, where have I been here before? And in that moment, I connected to a memory of my past. I was 11 years old. I was pedaling my bike furiously and I had a bag of donuts on either handlebar. Let me explain. So when I was growing up, because we had this custody arrangement of every other day, every other weekend, roughly, um, my dad was my basketball coach. I loved having my dad for my basketball coach. And the weekends I was at my mom's, he would come to pick me up early enough for warm up so that we could get to the game. And this one Sunday or Saturday, I was at my mom's house. My brother and his friends had sleepover and they were in the next room. And I'm up early getting ready for my game, trying to get breakfast. And my mom's like, you know what? It would be really nice to have donuts. I'm like, okay. You know what? Wouldn't you like to have some donuts? I'm like, what? mom, you, you can go get some at the store. No, I can't do that. I'm the only adult in the house. But you could get on your bike and go get donuts for the boys. Wouldn't that be nice? I'm like, but dad's coming. Oh, no, 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 you're fine. You've got enough time. Just, just hop on the, let me get you the money. So wanting to be a good daughter, wanting to eat a donut, I said yes, and I got the money, hopped on the bike, get to the store, get the donuts, feeling all grown up. And then I see the clock, and I'm like, oh, no. And so I furiously put them on the handlebars, and I'm going crazy trying to get back to the house. And I remember clearly seeing the corner, and I'm like, when I turn that corner, I will see if my dad's car is there or not. And if my dad's car is there, I am in deep trouble. And I kept pedaling, and sure enough, I turn the corner, and his car's there. And I just get this sinking feeling. And I throw the donuts in the house, go and hop into the car, and my dad says, what was that all about? And I quickly say, oh, Mom wanted donuts for, for John and the boys this morning. And my dad sighs, why do you let her push you around like that? And I remember just thinking, I can't win. I can't win here. I just slumped down in the chair and again, leaned my head against the side of the car, just feeling utterly destroyed, frustrated out of my mind because if I please one of my parents, then the other will be upset. There's no way I can please both of them. There's no way I can be a good daughter here. I was angry. I was full of shame. I was discouraged and I really felt hopeless. As a caveat, I want to say as a parent now, I have a lot of mercy on both of my parents. My mom was short-sighted. My dad was frustrated and he took it out on me. Millions of parents do this and I am one of those parents that do this to my kids. So I get where they were coming from. But the reality of little 11 year old Beth in that car saying to herself, I can't win, was that no one saw me. Both sides, my mom and my dad, had this pressure on me to do what they want, to be what they want. No one understood. No one knew what I was going through. And it felt like nobody cared, that I was utterly alone. And that was the hardest thing. So back to the present day, in my bedroom, leaning against the wall, I saw that 11-year-old girl, and I understood. And in my mind's eye, I wanted to give her a hug and just say to her, you had to be so strong, and you had to work so hard. You don't have to do that anymore. I'm here with you now. So now feeling more calm, I went to the bedroom to pray rosary with my husband and my children. In the dark, I just had these tears like flowing down my cheeks. And I was grateful for the tense exchange with my husband because it gave me insight. 
It led to the grace and the clarity of going back and meeting my 11-year-old self and of loving her. And it was another way that I could grow and meet Jesus and have him show me the truth and the reality of what I experienced and of who I truly am. So I have a lot of hope for each and every one of you that as things come up, as you find yourself activated or triggered, that you can lean in, that you don't waste those triggers, but lean into them and see where our Lord is in it. And in doing that over and over again, that you will be transformed. Because healing is possible, my friends, and it is for each of you. Let's pray together. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we know what it's like to be scared, to be uncertain, to be angry. We want something different than what our parents experienced, Jesus, than what we experienced. But so many of us don't know how to get there. Be with us and give us courage, Lord. When the things come up, help us to decide to meet you there and to do the work that you're asking of us so that we can have the freedom to love you and to love others the way that you created us to. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you very much. I really love the insight, too, of um, what was the quote from Pope Francis? The, our wounds are points of Intimacy. Of intimacy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think we actually see this in the liturgy, too. Um, mm-hmm. Like with incense, right? So incense is made from wounded trees. You wound mm-hmm. the tree and the sap comes out, and from the sap you make the incense. And that's turned into the worship of God, right? So, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to transition into a time of Q&A. Um, Camilla also has a mic, so she's going to help with, if anyone has a question on either side, we'll come and bring the mic up to you. You can ask Beth. Whatever you'd like. We've got about 15 minutes or so. so. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Here, I'm closer, so. Hi. I feel like I ping pong between justifying my parents Mm. and condemning them for even getting married in the first place because they were such an obvious mismatch. So how do you have that, like whenever I go, to, I've gone to therapy when the person is like, so what are your wounds with your mom? I'm like, well, she did the best she could. Mm. He did the best he could. Yeah. Because I saw, you're right, I saw their pain. I saw my mom crying in the closet, like the whole bit. Mm. So how do you find that middle ground between not justifying your parents but also not condemning them it is an excellent question like this is like level two question i think the phrase they did the best they could i I don't like as a mom i don't want my kids ever saying that about me i I screwed up i have harmed them i want to know how i did that because i want to repair that with them And I think to say that they did the best they could is like putting up a stop sign. Because if they did the best they could, why are you hurt? Because that's not the best. Because the best wouldn't have left you hurt. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think it's important to say, I would reframe it and be like, my parents have suffered greatly in their own childhoods which then played out in their marriage, which then trickled down to me. Um, I think seeing our, one thing too that, such a good question. Um, 
There's oftentimes a need where we want our parents to step into our pain and be the parent that we've always wanted them to be so that we can feel better. I know that feeling. I had that feeling very early on in the healing journey. And I'm like, how do I tell this to my mom? How can I tell this in a way that she will see and come to meet me in it and be there in it and, and make it better for me? And I will say, as I've continued to heal, there's been more and more of a release toward them, which is forgiveness, saying, you have caused this debt of harm to me, and I am going to turn that debt that you owe me over to our Lord. And he will be the one to issue justice however he pleases. I recognize you in your limitations, and I'm going to endeavor to love you right there. This takes a lot, a lot. Like, this is like the summit, you know, like to keep going to. Because I'm not, I might be there, like in one instance, but then something else happens, and I'm like, ah. Um, so I think when we can get to the point where we see our parents as human, because they are. And yes, they, they tried. And, and who knows? Maybe they didn't have as much support as they could have had. Maybe, you know, there's, there are things that could have gone wrong in their life that led there. There's things that they could have done differently. Um, but for them, just as us, I think there's, there's a true pronged way to look at it. It's not our fault, this pain that happened to us. But it is our responsibility. You can't just say it's my responsibility and be good to go. You can't just say it's not my fault and brush your hands of it. So our parents had that same choice with whatever their wounds were that they were bringing into marriage. That, that it wasn't their fault that they were given those wounds, but it was their responsibility. I will say too, like, even to this day, if my parents, and again, I love them both dearly, but if they were to come at me with curiosity and be like, what was it like for you? I mean, they've read my story. Neither of them really talked to me much about it. But if they engaged me on that level, oh, man, would that mean everything to me. And for whatever reason, they don't have the capacity to do that. So I pray for them every single day. I love them and honor them in the ways that, that I'm able to do that freely. But I still have boundaries as well. Um, in order to keep us both in a place that we can interact well um, with each other and have a relationship. Does that answer the question? Okay, it's a good one. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't know how to word it. I think I'm just curious about your personal relationship with Christ and what that, what that looks like. And obviously that's super expansive. Um, but I think particularly as a wife and a child of divorce, those things seem to really clash, um, at least like externally. Um, and just like, I don't know, how does he love you in mm. that? I think that's my question. It's a good question. It would take a long time to answer it. Um, it's definitely shifted. I would say before my breakdown, you know, with after baby number eight, it was more like, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. I want to love you, Jesus. Show me how to serve you better, Jesus. Like, very much, like, there. But I wouldn't call it intimate. But now... Um, yeah, he and I have done a lot of different things. And it, it's, now I feel like I just go and I'm like, what do you need to, what do I need to know from you, Lord? Like, I know you, like, I meditate a lot on just how he looks at me. You know, just really sitting in his gaze. Because again, I wasn't seen, heard, known, or understood as a child. So to have someone gaze at me in a penetrating way that sees me very deeply is like, whoo, that's uncomfortable. So it's kind of like going into that place and allowing him just to really um, speak all the things that he needs to speak enough so that they start to stick. Um, one of the points of my meditation recently that our Lord and I have been walking through, if I talk about it too much, I'll cry. Um, 
Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Um, yeah, it's just such a beautiful passage. So there's a lot that I'm, I'm gleaning from that about um, what he has to tell me. Another big thing that I can't not read in the chapel and just cry about is um, the poetry of St. John of the Cross. He's like my spiritual father, and there's something about his poetry that slays me like nothing else. Um, but yeah, right now, our, 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 my relationship with our Lord is very much one of attachment. If you know about attachment theory, he is like totally my secure base and the place I go back to when I'm like, what's going on, Jesus? Like, you said this, and now this is happening. Like, you want me to be calm, but this, you know, my kids and this and my husband that, like, <sighs> help me, bring, bring me down, bring me down, Jesus, you know, and he just if I journal or if I just sit and stare at the Eucharist or whatever it is, just, just to be. I feel like that's another thing. Like as a child, I didn't ever get to just be much. And so it started with saying, Jesus, be to me Jesus. Because if you look in the gospel, everyone's telling Jesus what to do. You know, Peter, wash my hands or wash my feet. No, don't wash my feet, Jesus. Wash all of me, you know. And Martha's like, tell my sister and again in here me and the pharisees are like jesus you can't do that you know everybody's telling jesus what to do and who to be there's a few people that actually see him for who he is mary just wants to sit at his feet you know our lady mary magdalene the woman caught in adultery that just see jesus for what he is and so i'm like jesus i want you to be yourself with me and the more i prayed that be to me jesus i felt like he was saying be to me beth i'm like oh, i don't know what that means you got to show me so, it's a great question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a fr like a very close friend whose parents separated, and so he suffered through divorce, I guess, like or through his parents' divorce, mm -hmm. and he doesn't really talk about it, but I I know it causes him pain. And I was just wondering from your experience, what can I do as his friend? Because I don't want to bring it up like if that's uncomfortable. But from your experience, what can I do to make him feel understood or make him feel better about that? Yeah. I would say a few, two words, curiosity and compassion. And empathy. We'll throw a third one in there. If you can put yourself in his shoes and just imagine what it would have been like for him, just picking up like little slivers and crumbs that he leaves around of his story, or if you meet one of his parents, just curious, what was it like for you growing up? Did, you know, what was it like at this house or this house? How did your mom fit into that? He may get uncomfortable because you're asking questions he doesn't want to focus on, and so maybe then you would back off. But sometimes I think if you just said, you know what, I just, th I, after meeting your dad the other day, I'm just, I just think, I wonder if it was hard for you. That phrase, I wonder if, is also a key one. I wonder if there was more to that story. And also just saying, like, I'm here if you ever want to talk about it. No pressure. But I, I, I love you. I support you. I appreciate our friendship. I know it was hard on you. And I'm here for you. Again, that accompaniment, because, again, very few people understood or saw it. I would go to the rainbow room in grade school where there was like the child psychologist and none of us knew what to say. And that I think is a part of it too because that fierce loyalty to our parents. We feel like if we have negative feelings, then, then we can't have negative feelings because our parents already had all the negative feelings. So we're just going to add our pain onto theirs and squash them. So pray for him every day. And ask the Holy Spirit when the right time is to, to just tell him what you see in a calm, compassionate, curious, empathetic way. But he's very blessed to have a friend like you that sees it and cares so much. There we go. Gabriel. Oh, um, oh there we go. Yes, sorry. Um, so I've been blessed with... Um, a really, really great mother, and uh, my parents were divorced when I was really young. I know that that's not something that she, uh, you know, went through with without concern for me. I've been like her number one priority, um, 
and uh, ultimately, I mean, like, I, I trust her judgment that it was necessary, mm -hmm. um, but of course those wounds are still there, so, I mean, what would you say about how to, I guess, how to approach, um, approach all of this with her, you know, without uh, it seeming like I'm, I'm placing guilt on her for creating a wound, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, I think to remember your healing journey is for you, first and foremost. And so there may be very well, especially if you're close, a time to bring her in. But I think it's, it's really imperative for you to go to those dark places in your own story and get your hands dirty in that take them to, to therapists or spiritual directors or mentors, you know, here, especially at school. Um, take it to our Lord and to really just mind that first. And I think it, once you do that enough, a, a way will form in how to bring it up to her. Um, and of course, pray for her every day that when that time comes, that she'll be receptive. Um, especially if, I mean, if she does love you and it's not her fault, but she's probably wondering, how did it affect my son? Um, a friend of mine and I recently sat down with a group of divorced folks in the Diocese of Denver and just answered questions. And they were just so grateful to hear um, and to be given a way to talk to their own children about it because they were told the children will be fine Don't bring it up. Just pretend everything's normal and for us to be like no bringing it up changes everything They were like, oh, there's a way through um, So yeah, that's great that you love your mom. You have a good relationship with her. That's a real blessing yeah. Hi, Ben. Hi. I really enjoyed listening to your talk. I resonated with a lot what you mentioned. Um, I am a child of divorce, and I have a younger brother. He's one year apart, mm -hmm. and we went through that whole experience together, but we never really talked about it. Yeah. And um, I guess my question would be, how could I bring, it, bring up that conversation to him? That way we can both heal together, because we both probably relate to a lot of um, experiences because we went through that together. Right. Um, I don't know this from personal experience because my brother is still on the same, the same way. He's, he's fine. He's totally fine. You know, I've not even shared with him that much of what I've done healing wise. I pray that someday I will. Um, you could just do something kind of squirrely and send him like a blog article or something like, Hey, I read this. This seemed to resonate. What do you think? You know, whenever you have something that's like a third party speaking into it, then you have something to direct things to instead of like, what did you think about it? I don't know. What did you think about it? You know, then you can talk about the blog article outside of both of you. Um, just this last weekend on the retreat that I was helping to lead, there were a brother and a sister that didn't know the other one was going to be there, and they never talked about it before. And, and even at our last small group, I had the brother in my group. And I'm like, how's it going? Have you guys talked about it? And he's like, no. And I'm like, I wish I could be a fly on the wall when, when that actually happens because they were going to go out to dinner. So it's, it's so interesting that in families where it's the same mom and the same dad who divorce, the, the siblings all have a radically different experience of the divorce, depending on how they were labeled in the family, depending on their age, depending on who was in the house or not in the house. There's, there can be just even, you know, the same loss, but different stories that still rhyme, but they're different, even within the same family. So I think if you can work to just understand and receive one another, um, the unity that could come from that, um, would be great. There's also, I didn't mention it, but there's a podcast specifically for adult children of divorce called Restored, um, Restored Ministry, so you could send them an episode, you know, something like that, that, hey, I don't know what you think about this, but hey, this was, I thought this was interesting. Who knows? But pray about it first, you know, our Lord will show you. Thank you. You're welcome. I can maybe take one more question. Um, there was we, one over here. We had one over here. Two okay. more. 
is there any recommendation on like, saints that you think it's um, easier to relate this to? As you said, like sometimes it's hard to pray to God as the Father, or sometimes pray to Mary or to Saint Joseph. So, any saint recommendations to form friendships with? Yeah. So Saint Eugene de Mazenod. Mm. Um, is the actual patron of children with divorced parents, divorced or separated parents. Um, St. Bridget of Ireland, I think is, I heard recently, is also um, patron saint of children whose parents are not married. Um, so those would be two to look at. It, it's interesting to note that, um, do you guys know who Mother Angelica is from EWTN? She's a child of divorce. She's not like a saint per se, but she's an American who did great things, who maybe one day will be a saint, that her autobiography is really fascinating from that piece. She always had a real heart for adult children of divorce. Um, yeah, so those would be two to go, go with. I think truly any saint, capital S, saint, is gonna have had some sort of suffering. You know, and so our suffering is unique, but their suffering is unique, but it's both suffering that can be mined to turn us into what Jesus wants us to be. So, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Hi. So I'm actually in the midst of being a child of divorce, mm -hmm. and growing up, it was a very manipulative household. So me and my brother kind of just had to fend for ourselves and raise ourselves. So we never really knew what love was. Mm. And I guess like the love that we never really accepted from our parents trickled to my relationship with our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Mother. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know how you accepted the love of Christ and accepted the love of our Blessed Mother. Yeah, I think really for me, um, a big part of it was what I said with my husband's love. Because if, if his love is trustworthy, then that's a new modeling, that's building a new template in my mind that I am worthy of love. Mm -hmm. And if my husband really means that he loves me when he says that he loves me, then oh, God is love, God loves you, what I've been hearing about since I was like three years old, maybe that's true too. So in that sense, like my, the sacrament of marriage has been really healing for me. Um, you can transfer that to attachment figures in your own life now. You know, if there's a priest, a spiritual director, a mentor, a dear friend, you know, that has just shown you outrageous love to like really lean into that. And I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong to say, I, I know you mean it when you say you love me, but it's not landing with me. And to get curious about that. I realized recently, like, would, I have certain friends that just affirm, affirm, affirm. Oh, it's so great. To see. You're so talented. I'm so grateful for you, blah, blah. Like, affirm, affirm, affirm when I'm, like, in a tough spot. And I realized, like, that doesn't land with me because I need to know they understand where I'm at first. So I realized for me to, un to receive that, I need validation. I need someone to say, I get it. That makes so much sense, what you're saying or what's hard but I want to pour truth into you. Like then I can hear it because all of a sudden we're like here, we're on the same place. They are with me in whatever I'm struggling with. So I think that point is a crucial one that not a lot of people connect with because we're not used to saying, that's really hard, I get it. Because we were like, oh, that's, that's hard and I don't want to come too close because I don't want that hard thing to, to get over into me and there's fear here and then we sense it here. And they, they don't want to go deep with us, so I'm just going to shut it down and put the wall up like I've done my whole life. So I think really having radical vulnerability in a safe place with someone who can become a sort of attachment figure can really rewire and shift and transform us. So if there's no one in your life right now that you're thinking could be that, just really bring it to the Lord. Like, Lord, I need someone to love me with your love. Send me someone like that. And Jesus will hear that cry. It may not be right away. I, I just had a CFR priest like fall from the sky and pray with me and has been, we've been in touch. And he's, the way that he's showing me love and care just blows my mind. 
So there are people out there that have that gift and can do it. It's just, it's going to take some time. Yeah, thank you. I'm really sorry, though, that that's happening right now. It's really hard. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I think that's a good transition point. Okay. Because um, what we're going to do is go into a brief time of prayerful reflection. I think Jiza and Nanafia are going to be leading us in some worship music. So if you want to get set up, that would be great. Um, and yeah, I, I think something that stuck out from the Q&A to me was um, Beth talking about uh, in prayer, contemplating the gaze of Jesus Christ for you. So how he looks at you and how he pierces you even. Um, and so yeah, this could be a time to, to step into that gaze of how he looks at you as an adopted child of Almighty God, of his Father. Um, and even if you don't have that person uh, who's a kind of template of the love of the Father for you, to ask him now. Ask and you shall receive. So let's go ahead and start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.